I'd weighed up everything uh, and I worked out what I really wanted to do, which was... So I started off in the UK with not very much money, um, not really that much knowledge on the industry and I found out about what courses you needed to do to basically start. You need an STCW and you need an ENG1 medical exam. So I looked up how to get those and I found out that you needed to go to a specific centre to do your STCW and you needed to get an approved doctor to do the, uh, the ENG1, an MCA approved doctor. So I looked up online where to find an MCA approved uh, doctor and the one that was closest to me and a reasonable price was in, in Winchester so I made my way down there and I, I got that done. It was uh, £80 so I could easily afford that and just, just get that ticked off. Then I needed to get my STCW so I looked that up online as well um, and I needed to obviously work out how much that was and what I needed to do in order to, to do that. So there were a few places that were sort of on my radar. Um, Warsash in Southampton. Heard some good reviews about their course that they're offering. Um, also looked into um, the Isle of Wight, so there's Flying Fish in UKSA. Uh, looked around some of, the, looked at their prices and what they offered. Uh, and essentially, the so the Warsash one was um, about it was a, a grand, so one thousand um, pounds, and I couldn't really afford to pay for that one. So I looked for the cheaper option, which was UKSA, which was uh, it's 800 if it was residential, but then I sort of figured out a way to do it non-residential uh, and I only had to pay 600. So obviously that reduced the cost quite a bit, but it was also, also had to fork out quite a bit of money. Um, and the way that I actually did pay for it was I kind of sold off all my stuff that I owned because this was something that I knew I really wanted to do. So especially as I knew that I was going to be away from home for a while, I wouldn't need all the stuff that I currently had. So I sold it all, I, I listed it on eBay and tried to get as much money as I possibly could um, just to pay for this for this course and obviously the living expenses that I had at the time. So paid for the course, got it booked in and then I, and then I did it and then I went to the Isle of Wight. Uh, I went there and did the, did the full course, five day course. Some courses you normally do just to get the ticket and, and then done, you, you just go through the motions, get the ticket and then, then you're away. But with this course, I actually quite enjoyed it. I thought it was quite an eye-opening course and it was quite interesting. I've done another few videos where I sort of explain what actually goes on through the course, but one of the highlights for me was the firefighting and um, it was really intense actually, what they got you to do. Um, but I won't go into too much detail, but um, I did. I did really enjoy that course, and it was. I think it felt a lot more worth it knowing how I managed to get the money to pay for it, um, and what I was sort of putting. I was sort of putting everything into it. So after I'd got the necessary entry requirements, the SCCW and the Eng One, it meant that I could start sort of applying to places. I could start filling out forms on, on agency websites and. It also meant that I could sort of finish off my CV and, and have that as a sort of standing point for when I was applying for places or even on Facebook or whatever it was. It means I had something that I could show people that uh, maybe were interested in hiring that I actually had something a bit more concrete than I want to do this. Because at the end of the day, you can't even be considered for a job if you haven't got the SCCW and Eng1. So that was a real sort of, turning point in, in, in which I could actually start applying for places and start being a bit more active. Anyway, I spent two weeks after the course just at, just at home applying, um, searching, doing a bit of research into the industry in general, getting an idea for it. Then I figured at some point I'm, I'm going to need to be where it's easy to be in contact, be basically immerse myself into the industry. So. It was choosing between Parma and Antibes, um, and in the end I did choose Antibes. And I think it, it wouldn't have really mattered where, where I went. For me, Antibes worked super well because I had access to loads of different ports uh, and places along the French Riviera. So you've got Monaco, Antibes, Gulf 
Golf Juan, Cannes, uh, basically the whole French Riviera essentially and even the Italian ri Riviera if I wanted to go that far. I never never did end up going that far but uh, Antibes gave me a lot more to offer than I originally thought so I'm definitely happy with the decision to actually go out to Antibes. Anyway so yeah I booked flights, um, it cost me £35 to fly out to Nice and then I got the train to um, Antibes which is crazy cheap which is so good obviously a single ticket as well and I probably had about maybe 100 200 pounds in my bank account so I needed to use that to live off for at least the next couple of weeks just before I flew out I had already lined up a job so I knew I had at least one job going and I was getting 100 euros per day for that so that meant I could survive for definitely that week I had also booked uh, an Airbnb which cost me around 150, 150 pounds I think. So it wasn't mega expensive but still I needed enough to sort of keep me going for at least that week, a couple of weeks. That's what I kind of planned for. I planned for definitely being able to stay in Antibes um, for, for two weeks. Uh, and yeah, so I flew out um, and I needed to be in Monaco to work my first ever bit of day work so um, I wasn't actually booked into the Airbnb for that night that I landed so I flew in at like nine o'clock into Nice I needed to be in Monaco at 8 a.m. I wasn't booked in for my Airbnb till the till the next night because that was the only availability that I could get and obviously I wanted to be in Monaco the night before just in case well I didn't really know the area so I wanted to give myself as much time as as much flexibility as much flexibility as I needed to so what I did was I went on couch surfing and it was really last minute it was literally like the three or four days before and I just what I did um, was I just requested like every single person in Monaco on couch surfing to see if anyone could just let me crash there just for the night for a couple of well for six hours or whatever it was um, and luckily this guy came through uh, and he let me stay in his uh, apartment for the night. That was a bit of a strange experience and uh, I won't really go into it at the moment. I think that's a story for another time, but it was, it was a strange and interesting experience to say the least. But anyway, I, I woke up that morning um, and got down to Monaco and Port Hercules. So this was my first experience of the scene, my first interaction with anything even related to super yachting. I, I, I got up, I went down to the marina. I was working at, I think, 7 a.m.? I think we started at 7, actually. Maybe it was 8. I can't remember. Anyway, it was fairly early. I, um, I got down there within plenty of time, I wanted to be on time, look presentable, sort of give a good impression because you never know where day work could convert into something more so I always tried to like make a good impression. So I, I started off, well, that was my first ever day, day's work and it was, it was awesome, it was, everything was, was slightly overwhelming because of, it was the Monaco Yacht Show um, and there was a lot going on of wealthy people, a lot of fancy cars, a lot of big boats uh, and I didn't really know too much of what was going on. All I, all I did know that I was working at, at seven and I was finishing at five and I was basically preparing the boat for this boat show. So that's what I was doing through that day. Um, and I loved, I loved every minute of it really. Um, I got introduced to a really nice crew and it was probably the best introduction that I could have had. There was no bad experience. It was just smooth running, it went well, um, and I got paid, and I, and I, and I went back to Antibes that night, and from there, that sort of kick-started the whole dock walking, the whole day work experience, the whole just getting myself really immersed into the industry, and also working out what I wanted to, to actually do. I had some vague idea of what I wanted to do. I wanted to work on maybe, uh, I think originally I wanted to work on like a 70 meter and I wanted it to be charter and I wanted to go across the Caribbean and all these things and I, and I had an idea of what I wanted to do but having actual experience really sort of shaped um, 
the reality of, of what I went on to to try and try and get and essentially I knew I wanted to just get my foot in the door so I was willing to jump on every and any opportunity that I could anyway if I fast forward a few weeks I was basically doing day work for a solid solid two or three weeks and then there became a bit of a, a sort of a dip there was a bit of a low point where I actually had no work going. I was still hunt, still hunting, still still job searching, uh, and going around all the different docks from Monaco, all the little different ports, uh, Bulio, Samer, if I remember off the top of my head. There were some more actual ports in Monaco as well. Working my way up all the way to Antibes, and then the other side of Antibes, where I was going to Cannes, Golf Juan, uh, Juan La Pan, like all these different ports where I was doing dock walking and trying to get work and just nothing was coming. Uh, and it was looking very dry and I was kind of weighing up all my options um, because at this point I still wanted to do a crossing. I still wanted to maybe pick up a boat that was that was crossing. And then I came across this this issue of the, the B1, B2 visa. And I'd obviously heard of it before, but I knew that it was possible to cross without it. My intention was basically to get on a boat that wasn't going to the States, that was just going to the, some of the Caribbean islands where you don't actually need the B1, B2. But I sort of later on realised that that was uh, a bit more risky than I originally thought. So uh, a B1, B2 visa was, was kind of essential for me to do that. But then I came across this sort of catch-22 where you need the, the visa in order to get a job in the first place. So people weren't accepting people without B1, B2 visas. However, in order to get a B1, B2 visa, you, um, you need a job in the first place to apply with, to say, look, this is what I'm doing, this is why I need this visa, um, can you issue it to me? Uh, and that's, that's how you would get it. Uh, and so that became a little bit of a complication, so I needed to kind of adjust uh, and work out what my, my plan, or what a sort of plan B could be if I, I couldn't get a B1, B2, or I couldn't get on a, a boat that was crossing. So I looked into sort of winter work and and um, yard work and, and sort of just getting my foot into the door, I think was essentially what it came down to. I think I had a lot of ideologies of what I hoped that I could get, but in reality I needed to work out exactly what was realistic and, and how do I actually get my foot into the door, into the industry, because that's essentially what I wanted to do. I needed just to get myself, um, needed just to get myself into the industry and work out what, what the best way to do that was. A few days past the sort of um, the drought, if you like, of not having uh, much work or any work, um, I stumbled across uh, some day work in. I stumbled across some some day work in in Antibes. Uh, and it was nothing to do with yachting at all. Basically, we were setting up for a festival. It was near Antibes, um, but the guy that was setting it up, he was a first officer uh, of a boat that was based in Antibes. And I was only supposed to be helping him for this one day, helping him set up for this festival um, and potentially helping um, take it down. Then, I got a phone call that evening after coming back from that day's work uh, and he basically explained that the, that the itinerary for their boat had changed. So they were packing down for the winter and all of a sudden their itinerary changes from being sat in Antibes uh, for the winter to suddenly becoming a, a charter boat in, in the Bahamas. Um, so they all of a sudden needed to prepare for a, for a viewing and basically set up the boat um, as if it was sort of charter ready. So they needed a couple of helpers so they, they hired uh, me and another guy just for the day um, to help clean and, and basically do the normal, normal setup, sort of the normal thing to make the boat look really great for, for a viewing. Anyway, so in that process, I began sort of thinking if they're going, suddenly going over to the Bahamas, they might need um, some extra crew. They might need uh, a deckhand or whatever, especially if originally they were planning to stay in, in France. They've now suddenly come across this new plan and if they need, need an extra pair of hands or whatever, that I was available to maybe cross with them so I had this kind of idea in my mind it wasn't really 
spoken about or talked about it was just like sort of a possibility that I sort of grabbed onto. Anyway, sort of long story short, that didn't really come into fruition. However, through all of these experiences that I've had through like day work and meeting different different people from the industry, I've managed to pick up some references for sure. I've picked up more knowledge from speaking to different people with different boats to see what, what it's really like across the boats, what's similar, what's different. Uh, and it sort of just gave me a lot of experience and insight into the industry, which I, I was super happy about on, on a reflection for sure. So yeah, they didn't, they didn't need anyone. Obviously I didn't get a phone call for that. Uh, and I went back to, to applying, back to searching, back to working out sort of what I wanted to do. So then about a week later, roughly a week later, again, through, through not really having any work at all, constantly applying, constantly looking online, constantly searching, nothing was really coming up until one moment when an agency called me up and they, they were interested in me potentially working in Toulon because they were after a windsurfing instructor. So I got the call from the agency to come in for a little interview, basically spoke to them. And once again, once again, that kind of fell through. They, they, they sort of showed interest, but then there was no, it didn't really, nothing came of it. It just it sort of stopped dead in the water and there was nothing, nothing really happened. Nothing came of, of that process of, of going into to the agency and having a chat with them. So that happened, I think, maybe once or twice an agency called me because a boat had showed interest in my, it wasn't me specifically they were interested in, it was more what they were looking for. So for example, if they were looking for a windsurf instructor, I had that. So that's why they approached the agency and the agency was just contacting me to let me know that they were giving my CV over. So in no way was it an offer or a real concrete opportunity at all. So that happened to me uh, sort of a couple of times and then, just nothing really came of it. So now we get to the point where about, it's about a week ago now, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, where I got a phone call. Now, I don't know, and I'm gonna try and find out. My CV got handed to this boat from me, dock walking in Cannes, a while ago, or if it was through a Facebook post, but it was one of the two for sure. I got a phone call to say we need some day work doing we need we need a worker to help us clean the boat and then detail it again ready for a viewing so this is quite common where day workers are hired just to get the boat ready so it's done efficiently and it's so I guess so the captain can like 100% know that the boat is going to be ready even if it's not really essential to have another day worker it's like just to just to rule out any possibility of the boat not being ready so uh, anyway I was hired for that day uh, to do some work and through the day uh, the relief captain was asking me lots of questions about me um, like my sort of background about my CV uh, and what uh, what I was looking for and he's really asking all these questions and I, I was sort of obviously taking an interest uh, and I was just wondering why he was really so interested in in my CV and my sort of job prospects anyway by the, by the end of the day he sort of slipped in that there might be an opportunity to work on this boat through the winter and as I say he only briefly mentioned it and it was not an offer of any sort again so I was kind of like a bit sort of apprehensive I was like yeah I'm available it will be great to have the opportunity to, to work with you guys but obviously let me know he needed to work out with the captain what exactly they were looking for uh, and if obviously if I was even appropriate for the job so he used I guess those two days or that day and then I, I worked on the next day um, he used those two days to sort of weigh up if I was applicable to, to the role that they, they were looking for so that Sunday evening he um, he basically said look the captain's coming on Wednesday just before the viewing on Thursday <clears throat> there's a possibility that you might be able to work on this boat have a have a conversation with the, the captain have a have a conversation with the captain on Wednesday just a quick conversation to see if it's the sort of thing that I, I want to do um, and also to see if that, that's what they're looking for so on Wednesday morning so I was booked in to have the sort of interview at 
at about two o'clock and on that morning all of a sudden I got a phone call uh, for a potential job opportunity again the same thing with the agency where they they rung me up and asked me if I was still available because there was a, a 75 meter that was looking to, to cross the Caribbean, a dual charter boat that was 75 meters looking to go to the Caribbean that needed a windsurfing instructor. So, so obviously that was on the cards as well and obviously that's something that I'd wanted to do for a while and all of a sudden it just popped up that they were crossing to the Caribbean doing a dual, dual season. It literally sounded exactly what I originally wanted to do. So, so when I went into the interview for the boat in Cannes, I had this idea in my mind, I had these sort of two opportunities that I had to sort of decide between and essentially when I was in the interview I, I sort of, when I was in the interview I, um, I basically asked them what they thought of it and, and asked them to give me some advice uh, and they were, they were great about it actually. They, they talked through the two different circumstances in, in detail, what is presented to you on, on paper and what in reality what it's actually like. And, and in that sort of meeting, I was, I was offered to work in Cannes. So I had basically the decision to make between a concrete job that I know I was certain of, um, with crew that I'd already met in a place that I already knew, versus um, a boat that I didn't know the crew of, I didn't know what the boat was like, I didn't know anything really. All I knew that it was getting paid slightly more, um, it would be crossing to the Caribbean and it would be dual, dual season. So, so I had the decision to make between those two boats and I, and I slept on it overnight on the Wednesday night and I was due to come back to Cannes Thursday morning uh, and by, by the Wednesday evening I'd worked out, I'd, I'd weighed up everything uh, and I worked out what I really wanted to do which was to work on this boat in Cannes. And uh, and, and essentially I, um, I w walked in on, on Thursday morning to, for a day's work and I, um, and I signed the contract there and then. I think th the second that I, I'm glad that I slept on the decision, but I think you always have sort of an instinct, a gut feeling of what the right decision is and, I, and that's the gut feeling I had. Um, and I think the only thing that was fighting me was what was on paper for, for the other job. I think that like more money initially sort of interested me, the, the going over to the Caribbean, the, the sort of dual season, the busy charter season, these things sort of popped out to me as, um, as, as quite interesting. But my gut feeling was always to, to work for the boat in Cannes. In the end, I, I sort of, I trusted the gut feeling and, and now I'm, I'm really happy with the decision that I made. And at the end of the day, you're not gonna know the alternative, so it doesn't actually matter. But I was happy that I went with the gut feeling and, um, and yeah, that is how I got my first ever job on a super yacht.